Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Welcome everyone. Officially, I'm Arielle Cates. I'm the director of programming at Village Preservation. I'm so glad that you're all here with us this evening. Just a quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities. We are a nonprofit membership based organization, so your support um, and involvement mean the world to us. You can learn more at our website, villagepreservation.org, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. Um, hope you can't hear this. So just a bit of Zoom protocol. Um, I won't be visible during the talk, but I'll be here along with my wonderful colleague, Hugh. So please feel free to use the chat to say hi, tell us where you're joining from, or to raise any issues or thoughts. If you have questions for our speakers specifically, please use the Q&A function. It just helps um, me to keep track of them. You can do that at any point during the talk, and we will try our best to get to as many of those as we can following the presentation. So I am very delighted to introduce tonight's presenters. Moby Dick has been cited as one of the founding fathers of the modern day drag king movement, beginning in 1995 in the East Village. Mo produced and hosted Club Casanova, the world's first weekly party dedicated solely to drag kings. Mo has been featured in the Drag King book by Judith Jack Halberstam and famed photographer Della Stella Grace Volcano and was featured in documentaries on MTV, HBO, and Sundance, as well as indie films, television, and theater. Everything. It's a very long list. Um, in, in January 2018, Mo and Ken Vegas co-created DragKingHistory.com, which was archived by the Library of Congress in 2020. So amazing. Mo continues to gather, document, and celebrate drag drag kings as a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. Ken Vegas is Drag King History's webmaster. Um, after attending the International Drag King Extravaganza in 1999, he began to document the burgeoning drag king scene by creating King, a self-published zine. This grew into a larger project called Kingdom Magazine, um, which covered the growth of the international drag king extravaganza and worldwide drag king everything. <laughs> um, Lisa Davis is a villager and a writer. She taught at SUNY and CUNY and at Hunter College. Her books Under the Mink and Undercover Girl, the lesbian informant who helped the FBI bring down the communist party <laughs> chronicle key moments in village history. Her current research details the career of entertainer Blackie Dennis, who you will hear many things about, the women she loved, and the places where she performed. Alyssa Goodman is a New York-based writer and photographer. She's currently at work on her first book, Glitter and Concrete, a cultural history of drag in New York, forthcoming from Hanover Square Press. Keep an eye out. She's the former drag history columnist at Them and also has written about drag for Vice, Billboard, CR Fashion Book, and Hyperallergic, among many others. Additional writing and photography credits include Vogue, Vanity Fair, The New York Times Style Magazine, The New Yorker, and many more. There are lots and lots of links for you to learn more about all of our speakers, which I am going to put into the chat right now and also include in our follow-up email in case you don't want to click on everything right away because Mo is gonna kick us off. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, folks, let's party. Hey, uh, thank you, Ariel. 
And uh, we want to thank the Village Preservation and the New York City LGBT Historic Sites Project for hosting this event today. Thank you. Folks, we got a disclaimer. I'd like to preface our presentation by saying that by no means does this encompass every single performer in New York City's Drag King history. <clears throat> we did our best to pick a variety of performers for you. Be sure to visit our website, dragkinghistory.com for more in-depth research and information on all the performers. All right, next. With pride, we begin with Charlotte Cushman, who specialized in breeches roles, playing over 30 male roles from 1835 to 1875. The photo is Romeo in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and here is her costume as Cardinal Wolseley in Shakespeare's Henry VIII, which is in the Smithsonian Institute. Huh? Pretty cool. So it's to be noted that the U.S. Library of Congress contains Charlotte's personal papers, which document that all of her romantic relationships were with women. And she started her autobiography, I Was Born a Tomboy. Next, Kitty Blanchard. She was a Broadway star who depicted the Wild West in her male impersonation role as Billy Piper in the Day Nights, which made its New York City premiere in August 22nd, 1877. This was the birth of a new sort of theater called Frontier Drama. Next, British-born Annie Hindle was the first uh, male impersonator to appear on variety stages in the US in 1868. She enjoyed a long, prosperous career delivering songs in a low alto voice that connected with the working class men by defending their masculinity. Interesting to note, she was officially married four times, folks, twice to men and twice to women, including her dresser, Annie Ryan, and to uh, Louise Spengel, commonly called a player. <laughs> Next, and here's another Brit. We have Bestie Bonehill who in 1889 was invited by vaudeville producer Tony Pasta to perform in his New York theater on 14th Street. Interesting to know for her, many of her songs were written by Arthur West, a friend of Charlie Chaplin. Next. And for the trifecta, we have Britain's most celebrated male impersonator, Vesta Tilly who was wildly popular on a variety of vaudeville stages, having toured the US six times. During World War I, she sang patriotic songs to promote enlisting drives, hence she's wearing a military uniform. And next, now we have African-American male impersonator, Florence Hines, who performed between 1890 to 1906. This is the only known photo of her from a newspaper article. She was hailed as the Vesta Tilly of black male impersonators playing a dandy, which was the depiction of a well-groomed, well-dressed man. This was in direct contrast to the gross depictions of black masculinity in minstrelsy. As a male impersonator, Florence crossed racial, so social, and gender barriers. Next, this character was drawn by Reza Gavney for an article written by Hugh Ryan for them. Next. Now we have Philadelphia born Ella Wessner, who was a, uh, from a family of dancers. So she decided to incorporate dance into her act. She began performing as a male impersonator in July, 1870 at Tony Pastor's New York Theater. Interesting to note that her wish was to be buried in her male costume. And she passed away in November of 1917 in her best suit. Next, <clears throat> we have Gowango Mohawk, who was one of the first American Indian actors to perform in the American stage and the first known American Indian male impersonator. She wrote, directed, and starred in several productions that she toured throughout, throughout the US and Europe. She signed autographs as Aboriginally Yours, reinstating her indigenous identity. And the other photo is a promo for her play called Wepton Noma, the Indian Mail Carrier. Next, <coughs> we have Maud Adams. Hmm. Her most famous role was playing Peter Pan. And she was the first actor to play this role on Broadway. 
she wasn't the first actor ever to play it, but the first one on Broadway. I want to clarify that. She helped create the costume setting a fashion trend. Hello, the Peter Pan collar. She invented it. She played several male roles in her career, but it was Peter Pan that she was best known for. Maud was not open about her romantic relationships, but it was known that she enjoyed long-term relationships with two women over the course of her life, with Lily Florence and with Louise Boynton. Next. We have Ada Overton Walker, who was the queen of the cakewalk. Here she is with her husband, George Walker. In 1909, out of necessity, Ada became a male impersonator in the last few years of her illustrious career. When George, her husband, died suddenly, she assumed his role in her show, wearing his costume, a suit, straw hat, spats, white gloves, and a cane, and singing his signature song, Bon Bon Buddy. And next, we have Gladys Bentley who was a prolific African-American out and proud lesbian and body gender bending entertainer during the 1920s Harlem Renaissance. Here she is wearing her signature white tuxedo and top hat. She performed at the Apollo Theater, the Cotton Club, the Clam House, and as a headlining act at the Eubangi Club where she created her own musical review with the chorus line of male impersonators and women's drag. All right, folks, next up we have Lisa E. Davis. Take it away, Lisa. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the only reason I can talk about what I'm talking about is because I was fortunate enough when I was much younger to meet some of the people that you see here, particularly the young lady on the far left, the blonde, her name was Gail Williams at the time. That was her stage name. This is a picture from the 181 Club. What I'm going to do, the landmarking people have done amazing work as far as locating where the clubs from way back when were. This is from probably about 1948. I, by the way, fished this out of uh, Gail Williams' garbage pail when she was living in Florida. I said, Gail, why are you, what are you throwing this away? She says, oh, nobody cares about that anymore. Hello. Well, we do care, don't we? This is the 181 clo uh, on 2nd, 181 2nd Avenue between 11th and 12th, uh, the site now of the Village East Cinemas, formerly the Yiddish Theater. So it had a long history. It was as uh, elegant as the Copacabana, they said. It ran from about from 1945 to 53. Next. Here's some more. This is uh, the kind of thing that the kids did. This is Gail. They waited tables. Uh, you can see from the mid shot what some of some of the audience looked like. Of course, without the mafia, there would have been no clubs like this. Uh, in Midtown, there had been a flourishing uh, theater with vaudeville burlesque, lots of gay people, lots of gay clubs. In the 30s, they started closing them down because it was just too dangerous. They couldn't believe there were so many gay people in the world. And here's to you, Gail. Next. There's Gail and one of her girlfriends, Tony Bennett, because along with the drag kings, you usually had a stripper and Tony was one of those. Her real name was Eileen Hayes. She came from Kansas City. I as I say, I was fortunate enough to know these people personally. They were very kind to me and they were authentic. I wrote something about them <laughs> that I will read briefly. They were the most authentic people I ever knew. Honest, open, critical, tolerant, gossips, tight-lipped, sneaky, trustworthy and they were kind to me. Tony Bennett, Eileen Hayes from Kansas City who came to New York the way people used to do and learn to strip on 42nd Street but then business was transferred to the village. Next. Ah, well there you are. 
those are the people in the uh, in the cast. There was someone named Pat Burns who was a bit older. They all talked about Pat Burns and I have not been able to get information on her. I did get a little hint, but you'd be surprised how people don't want to tell you, don't want to share photos even if they have them because I suppose they still consider it disgraceful. Adrian, who was a drag, uh, drag queen, lived uh, until very recently in the village. I don't know if he's still around. He was a good friend of Tish, who died recently. Uh, next, Let's see what else we got. Ha, huh. we are moving on from the 181 to the Howdy Club, which actually preceded the 181. The Howdy Club ran from about 1935 let me see, what did I write? 1935 to 45, when they were closed down for immoral uh, activities. The police were always alert to that sort of thing. They were on West 3rd Street, 47 West 3rd Street. The landmarking people have, have noticed that there's nothing there because it's the NYU library, which is NYU has done quite a job of taking care of that. And there were many, uh, these are the performance spaces. These are the nightclubs, but there were many lesbian bars along West Third Street, mainly because early on, if you look at the old subway and elevated train maps, the elevator, and there's a beautiful, a be beautiful painting by John Sloan showing the Sixth Avenue elevated train turning east on Third Street, and under that elevated train where property was cheap and uh, the underworld, there were many lesbian bars. The Howdy was one of those. Uh, Gail and Tony, actually, the friends you made in the first uh, from the 181, were recruited out of the Howdy Club to work on stage. That's the way they did it, the mafiosi would uh, pick the girls they thought had potential. And that was the case for many people. They were just recruited out of the lesbian bars to go and uh, work on stage. There you are. And uh, Blackie Dennis met, uh, also worked at, thank you. Blackie Dennis also worked the Howdy Club. She met her girlfriend, shall we see next? Who have we got next? Blackie Dennis was gorgeous. Here we are, This, as I say, this was an accepted form of entertainment. This is from the Women's Wear Daily, okay? Where they are announcing that Blackie Dennis, whose real name was Michelina Lombino, and I thank the Lombino family profoundly for their cooperation and sharing photographs and news clippings like this because they adored their Aunt Blackie. They were not ashamed. And uh, here she is, they're announcing in the middle of all these guys, here's Blackie Dennis at the Howdy Club. Next. So it was not too risque. And here she is, not too clear, I'm afraid. It says Club Ha Ha, at least it should say that. The Club Ha Ha, the original, was on uh, West 52nd Street. But as I said, that, that was closing down. So there was a man named Charles Bay Baker who set up a ha-ha. You get the idea, this was fun. It was fun and it was funny. You don't have to take it seriously, seeing all these women dressed up like men and men dressed up like women. Don't worry about it, it's just for fun. Uh, set up the Ha Ha Review, where Blackie worked for 10 or 15 years. They worked basically in New York. And at the Ha Ha, there we are, the Ha Ha Review. And sometimes they traveled around the country. Imagine Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Hey. Anyway, what's next? Ah, yes. Blackie had, uh, had a girlfriend. Now, I don't know why they both had both chose the same last stage name, but they did. 
So Blackie Dennis, who was Lombino, became Dennis, and uh, Dorian, who was Renee Eisenstadt, who graduated from NYU with a bachelor's degree in chemistry and went to work for the city of New York, unfortunately analyzing garbage or sewage or something. She got the message quickly that that was not going to be a lot of fun, so she became a stripper. But anytime they wrote up Dorian Dennis, and they wrote up Dorian Dennis a lot, they usually mentioned the fact that she was a very educated stripper and drop dead gorgeous. This was Blackie's girlfriend for life. She also had another girlfriend who had money and paid the bills. But Dorian made a lot of money too. Big money in stripping. It was a good, it was a good job if you were good at it. What's next? Ah, okay. Now, moving from the 181, we did the Howdy Club. We're now going to the Moroccan Village, which was the other big uh, entertainment venue for drag kings, drag queens, and others. Uh, that's uh, on 8th Street, which used to be a fabulous nightclub thing before it became retail space available and little sheds for uh, eating tortillas and things. I was looking the other day actually for number 23 and I remember once upon a time I could find number 23. I can't even find number 23 again. I included a photo of Jackie Mae just so you get the idea and the girls and the boys got on quite well really. But that at least gives you an idea. He was quite, quite well known. Gives you an idea of uh, what the shows might have been like at the Moroccan village. What's next? Well, this is Blackie at the Moroccan village, where she was with the Ha Ha Review in the 1950s. Unfortunately, and these things happen from time to time, there was a shootout at the Howdy club in 1938, but a bigger shootout in 1950 at uh, Moroccan Village where the shooter grabbed the mic away from Blackie Dennis and uh, announced that, you know, this is a holdup. Uh, things, were, things were difficult in the 50s in the village and finally the girls, Rusty, that was Blackie's other girlfriend, uh, Dorian and Blackie all retreated to Florida where protection was better and they worked mostly out of Bay Baker's Ha Ha Club in Florida after toward the end of the 1950s. They all decamped to Hollywood, Florida. But this is Blackie, this is Blackie at the Moroccan Village, which she a vineyard she shared with next. Next, a venue she shared with our other heroine, uh, Buddy Kent. That was Buddy in her Fred Astaire, with her Fred Astaire look, with her uh, top hat and tails. When she was working in Rockin' Village with uh, Kiki Hall's review, which traveled uh, very widely. They had a big run in Atlantic City. They had a big run in Europe. And they were back in New York at the Moroccan village and Buddy, who made a wonderful, one of the most valuable pieces of information we have about this period and these people in 1983, made a series of tapes with Joan Nessel of the Lesbian History Archives about her life. And this is of course part, a big part of her life. And she, she the story she told was that uh, uh, Blackie Dennis wasn't necessarily happy to see them come in because she was worried that there wouldn't be enough money for everybody. But fortunately, the crowds were big, the money flowed. This was, of course, uh, during the war, right after the war, that war, the one we won when we were the good guys. So there was a lot of money. So that was at the Moroccan village. The next shot of Buddy is uh, next. Next shot of Buddy is at uh, Buddy Beck, also worked the 181. 
And I asked her, I said, so who's this, uh, who's this dame, you know, with you? She says, I don't know, some hooker, because that was part of the, that was part of the audience also. Prostitution was a big issue. And I love the fact that the lady in the back who was uh, bridge and tunnel possibly coming in to see the queers well, did not want to have herself photographed or recognized. But uh, Buddy looks great. What's next? Ah, well, after a while, like about after 19, in 1953, the 181 closed. And uh, there were other possibilities, but Buddy had a different idea. She, she developed for herself a strip act. And she played, among other places she played, but uh, one of the big places she played was Jimmy Kelly's nightclub, which was on one of the original first nightclubs in New York City on Sullivan Street. You will recognize, you will recognize the building because it was where the Fantastics played for 20 something years before they converted the building into some ugly little glass front condo. But Buddy was gone by then and she didn't care. Uh, she was very popular at Jimmy Kelly's. Of course, his name was not Jimmy Kelly. His name was Giovanni de Silvio. But, you know, Irish, Italian, you had to make your choices. So she played there. She played there for a while. Then seeing how the business worked, next. <laughs> Buddy Kent. Buddy Bubbles Kent, her real name was Malvina Schwartz, of course, from East New York, Brooklyn. If you know Brooklyn, East New York, Renee Eisenstadt, Dorian Dennis, was also from East New York, Brooklyn. Produced some interesting characters back then. This is Buddy, she actually seems to be wearing a skirt on your left. Don't know who the two people there, the next two, the one with the cigarette holder is Jackie Howe, who was uh, a partner in this enterprise. And the other partner was their manager, Kiki Hall. This was called the Page Three, which was on the corner of Charles Street and 7th Avenue. It was a lovely nightclub, which ran for about 10 years, 54 to 64. Want to see another shot from the this is what, what people did at the page three. They wanted to have their picture made with the drag kings, let us say, with Buddy and Jackie. And these are housewives probably from somewhere who have come to see the queers and they're having that picture made. It was a big, it was big business for the local photographers. He would take the picture, run home, develop the picture, come back and charge the people money, which they were happy to pay, I assume. Anyway, that's the kind of thing. And they had live entertainment, a lot of live entertainment at uh, the page three that lasted for 10 years. Buddy said that uh, the disco, disco stuff put them out of business, I guess so. It's now the Agave Mexican restaurant. If you're ever over that way, Charleston 7th, have a look. It used to be the page three, a very notorious and wonderful uh, nightclub. Next. Oh, now the one that everybody knows about, this program of vacation and color is from the 82 club. Everybody knows the 82. If you're, we've ever done anything with this material, you know that you're always seeing pictures of drag queens and it looks like great fun. But I found this program, this is something produced by Kit Russell, who was the producer director at Club 82. What you can't, I know you can't read it, but down at the bottom, it gives us a date, 1953. And I was looking at this and I see the names of people besides Gail and Tony that I knew. And I couldn't believe that they were working at the 82 because I never knew they worked in the clubs, but by God, they did. Blackie Savage, Sully Sullivan. I know you can't read these, take my word. Pat Burns, uh, Mickey Falby, who was, a very beautiful film that I knew. Uh, 
all worked at the 82 Club, but nobody ever talks much about the girls at the 82 Club. Well, here they are. There were girls. And I wrote about them. And the book's still up on Amazon. You'll forgive me, it's on Amazon. That's how you sell books. Thank you. The end. Woo! Hi, Stormy. Thank you, Lisa. All righty. Uh, we could, there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Stormy Delarvier was a very well known male impersonator who performed with the Jewel Box Review from 1955 to 1969. This was a multiracial show that was billed as 25 men and one girl and toured throughout the US during a very homophobic era. With her baritone voice and slick looks, a few you know, very few people guessed that she was the one girl. And uh, here we have Storme is with a, a few of her fellow cast members and uh, where they frequently, and they frequently performed at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. And I was actually in touch with the uh, archivist, nice guy, if you never need to know. Okay, next. This photo is by celebrated photographer, Diane Arbus from 1961. Next. Now this is how I knew Storme when she worked the door at the cubby hole in the West Village and pa pat uh, patrolled the streets, uh, keeping her children safe by making it known that she was packing heat. And uh, interesting to note that she personally asked me to make sure that she was known as a male impersonator and not a drag king. Why? Because it was more esteemed in her time to be called a male impersonator. The term drag king didn't really exist then. And uh, so it's just more esteemed. So next, the Wow Cafe Theater, which I hope most of you know, if not all, it started as an international women's theater festival in October of 1980, where gender play and cross-dressing were essential elements in its formation. It was founded by Split Bridges members, Lois Weaver, Peggy Shaw, as you can see here in the photo, and Deb Margolin, along with Jordy Mark, Pamela Kame, and et cetera, a bunch of, bunch of people. So next, notable artists showed their work here, such as Holly Hughes, Carmelita Tropicana, Lisa Cron, Five Lesbian, Lesbian Brothers, and more. Here we see a photo still from the play Paradise Lost by Lisa Cron in 1988. Next, the tradition here is that women and their transgender people provide the central creative impetus behind a show at WOW. So the green flyer is from the reality show on April 11th, 2003 with Drag King host Surreal, Drag King Ian Black, and from Chicago, Drag King Lucky Strike as Elvis. I want to get a, give a shout out uh, to Drag King Mr. Coles who is uh, in attendance and who is very much a part of WOW Theater and uh, has done many productions there as well. Uh, so as I said in my disclaimer, we didn't get to mention every single person, but doing our best. So the other fly is from the Freak Affair on March 27th, 2020, hosted by Drag King Uncle Freak. Next, Johnny Science was an FM pioneer who co-founded the FM fraternity which was the first support group to meet in New York City for female to male transsexuals, female to male cross dresses, their partners and friends. And he was co-founder of the Drag King Workshop where he created Drag King looks using his makeup skills. His contribution to Drag King history is immense as he elevated our art form with his makeup techniques. This photo is from the Drag King Workshop circa 1992 by Efren Gonzalez. Next, we have a photo of Johnny with Kit Racklin and they were very good friends. And this is from Halloween. And on the other side, we have Johnny. He became a leader in the gay male leather scene. And uh, this is pretty much what he looked like then and how, it, and you could read more about him. We just posted his profile on dragkinghistory.com. Okay, next, Diane Tour was a drag king pioneer, gender activist, and performance art pro provocateur who blazed the trail for the drag kings of today to emerge. She co-founded the Drag King Workshop 
incorporating physicality, movement, and psychology behind the character work. Next. The Drag King Workshop became Man for a Day, and this is from Katerina Peters' documentary from 2012. And Diane co-authored the book, Sex, Drag, and Male Roles with Stephen Bottoms. It is a must read folks and can be found in the Drag King History Bookstore. Next, here we have Shelley Maws in her first film role playing Martin in Monica Troit's film, Virgin Machine in 1988. She went on to create several notable male characters for several of her solo shows. Next, in 1990, the first Drag King workshop was created by makeup artist Johnny Science, Drag King Diane Tour, and performance artist Annie Sprinkle. Here are before and after shots of participants from 1993 in New York City as featured in an article for the Washington Post by Paula Spann. Next, we have Busta Hyman, Julie Wheeler, and just, just in case. These three drag kings were active in the New York City downtown scene in the early 1990s and influenced more drag kings to emerge. Next. Oh, who's that? <laughs> uh, I began in November 1995. I produced and hosted the Drag King Party Club Casanova, which we're going to see in a few minutes. Um, and as Ariel said, I'm cited as one of the forefathers of the modern day drag king movement. This photo is by a photographer named Pat Rivera, who was mentored by Nan Golden. Next, many thanks to all the wonderful photographers who freely shared the work with me. This photo is by Efren Gonzalez, and it made the cover of Black Sheets, a gay male leather magazine. Next, and here I was impersonating John Sex, who was a downtown performer. Uh, his shirt was gifted to me by Danny Johnson. Next, this was taken at the top of the World Trade Center in 1997 by Lucien Samaha. Next, this photo by Della Grace Volcano was for the 2002 uh, documentary, Drag King documentary called Venus Boys by direct, directed, produced, uh, and shot by Gabrielle Barr. And the photo, funnily enough, uh, landed on a phone booth in Belfast, Ireland. <laughs> Now, Venus Boys was the first ever feature length documentary about drag kings. Next, we have a beloved Haitian American drag king, Dread, who began in December 1995. Next, this is Dread with fellow uh, drag king, Sean. They did numerous duets together. And uh, this was photographed by Della Grace Volcano for the drag king book. Next. She was a gender bender extraordinaire as evidenced here. Next, this photo still is from the Drag King documentary, Venus Boys, with her performing partner and longtime friend, Queen Bee Luscious. Next, in Murray Hill, who began in 1996 as the hardest working man in show business. In 1997, he ran for mayor of New York City as the first drag king to run for a political office. And folks, he garnered a couple hundred write-in votes. Uh, next, he produced and hosted the first ever Drag King Invitational in New York City on October 7, 2001. Nowadays, you can see him in solo shows at Joe's Pub, hosting the Oscars, doing holiday shows, and a guest star on Amy Schumer's latest television show. Next. Club Casanova was the world's first weekly drag king party from 1996 to 1997, and its influence is still felt today. This photo is from our first ever professional photo shoot for Club Casanova by Michael Wakefield. And in it, you're gonna find the drag kings who started many of the first Club Casanova shows. Next. Now this is a flyer from a drag king contest at Hippie Chicks Gallery on December 17th, 1995 at Global 33 Restaurant, which was located at 90, uh, 93 Second Avenue. Dread won it and was the first of many drag king contests that she won. Next. Now we have Club Casanova's first flyer, A Night with the Beatles that was on March 31st, 1996. That was opening night at Pyramid Club, 101 Avenue A. Next, 
This is our Leather Daddy shoot for the Drag King rendition of the film Cruisin' by Al, uh, with Al Pacino. And this photo is by Efren Gonzalez and it was taken at Cake at 99 Avenue B in 1996. Just so you know, so the Club Casanova moved around in the beginning. We had to find our place and our place was at Cake. That's where it clicked. Okie dokie. So the next shot is a crowd shot of Drag King pencil case uh, hula hooping. Folks, notice the press. Look at, the, look at it, the press on the bottom and you can see the ca film cameras. There's two film cameras in the press. The small little bar and we had so much exposure, it's crazy. I wish, wish we could see that today, but uh, one day. Um, next, we have Murray Hill announcing his candidacy for mayor of New York City in 1997. This photo is by Lucien Samaha. And next, this was from 1998. This is the men of Club Casanova with Stormé de Larvier at the New York City LGBT, uh, I believe it's now called LGBTQ Plus Center Community Center. Next, folks, we garnered a lot of press and we were very, very grateful for everything. It was just uh, mind blowing how much press we got and it was really cool. People came in, like I said, the press all over the world and we were in all kinds of magazines and it was pretty fucking cool. Um, all right, next. Now these two articles are from May 1997, 1997 and they signaled the beginning of the end of the vibrant nightlife community in Manhattan. Then Mayor Ru Giuliani decimated clubs, bars, and performance venues all because he didn't like them. Now you could read these articles on my website, Mr. M R M O B D I C K dot com. You could read it, you know, I saved it all. Next, folks, what's a party without merch? Club Casanova merch. Our motto was where everyone is treated like a king. And I'm gonna note here, we will be reissuing these t-shirts very soon. So be sure to sign up for our newsletter at dragkinghistory.com and to keep up to date with everything Drag King related. Next, we have multi Grammy award winner, Joyce D. Donato. She is an opera star known for her breaches and end and travesty roles. She's performed at the New York Met, Carnegie Hall, et cetera, et cetera. Her album from 2011 called Divo Diva explores the duality of breaches versus skirt roles in opera. She and I actually met while we were doing the podcast Aria Code for the Met and uh, check out season three, episode number 13. It's really fun and terrific. Alrighty, folks, now we have a presentation by Alyssa Goodman. Take it away. Hi. Um, so Mo mentioned Giuliani and his mayoralty ended in 2001. But right before the end of his term, uh, he instituted one more wave of what he called his quality of life initiative in 2000. And nightlife as it had flourished and been beloved took even more of a hit than it already had. It became difficult, though not impossible, to find places to perform around the city. But by the time, but by that time, 9/11, uh, sorry, <laughs> but by the time 9/11 happened, there were even more changes afoot. Black Book Magazine shared in 2013 that, quote, the way people went out, how they interacted with each other and others unlike themselves changed and can be linked directly to the post 9/11 psyche. The magazine later referred to this as sin, safety in numbers, and said that, quote, for the most part, clubs got smaller to handle crowds with specialized tastes, a clientele that wanted to hang with familiar faces. Manhattan was still a nightlife capital of the world, and it was there that the lounge, as opposed to the club, and its accompanying bottle service became the order of the day. But if you didn't want that scene, you'd have to go someplace else. By the beginning of the decade, there were many nights where you'd be going to Brooklyn or even the depths of Queens. When the Backstreet Boys' I Want It That Way was released in 1999, T. Cooper was working at Teen People, fact-checking the band's lyrics with their publicist. He decided they were about anal sex and that there had to be a parody performance. The Backdoor Boys, pictured here, were born shortly after, a drag troupe parodying the boy band who were at the top of the charts at the time. They debuted in all of their butch glory at the book party for Jack Halberstam's female masculinity at Blue Stockings on the Lower East Side. 
They were eventually booked across the city at venues like Siren and the Slipper Room and the annual New Kings on the Block event, which also highlighted veteran performers like Murray Hill and Dread. They also performed up and down the East Coast, though Cooper once joked in an interview that they had been booked as far away as Malaysia. Uh, when Mayor Michael Bloomberg took office in 2002, it seemed not much would change for nightlife despite Giuliani leaving office. In fact, for a while, the new mayor had proposed bars and clubs close as early as 1 a.m. While this ultimately never came to fruition in his 2002 State of New York speech, Bloomberg also discussed what would later be known as Operation Silent Night, meant to quiet areas in certain neighborhoods after a certain hour. This would also impact nightlife, increasing police presence in the East Village and Greenwich Village, as well as other areas across the city largely populated by people of color. By the end of his administration, Bloomberg would also affect nightlife in parts of Brooklyn, like Greenpoint and Williamsburg, when he rezoned them for residential buildings. This meant that venues like bars and clubs and the noise that they bring with them soon wouldn't be as acceptable in those neighborhoods either and would move further into the borough by the beginning of the next decade. Next slide, please. Dr. Wang Newton was born on Halloween 2004 in Philadelphia, but was soon performing in New York venues like famed yet now defunct lesbian bar Ruby Fruit and Hell's Kitchen's Vlada. Their onstage persona, I wrote in 2018, is, quote, that of a 1970s Vegas-style MC, a Taiwanese version of Wayne Newton attired in a red or black embroidered suit, an Elvis wig, aviator-style glasses, thick eyebrows and mustache, and a giant red lace thong in their pocket to dab away perspiration for comedic effect. Wang was interested not just in gender fucking with his drag, but what he has called culture fucking, parodying cultural stereotypes to reveal their absurdity. Next slide, please. And here is a clip of Wang in action at New York Fashion Week. Hey baby, Wang Newton Fashion Week, New York City. Here I am with the Joe Galaxy and some sexy radies. This is how we do. Oh, Joe, baby. Yeah, you baby. see them like, like Zoolander? Kind of look. <laughs> the radies don't love it. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. By the time Wayne began performing lesbian bars, some of which had featured drag kings in the past were still an active phenomenon. They began to significantly decrease as the decades wore on. As of April, 2021, the New York Times reported that there were only three lesbian bars in the city. Venues that were more generally queer emerged and invited drag into their spaces as well, of which kings also became a part. Beginning in 2008, Kay James, pictured here, began performing with Switch and Play, a gender expansive drag and burlesque alliance established in the borough in 2006. Switch and Play had hosted open drag nights, welcoming new performers at Outpost Lounge in Brooklyn. And as soon as Kay James performed Color Me Bad's Sex You Up on their stage, he said in 2013 that, quote, his fate was sealed. Heavily influenced by George Michael, his performances, he writes, quote, explore iconic masculine images through a queer and trans lens. From the stage of Switch and Play's home bar branded saloon and beyond, Kay James has become considered not just a modern drag king legend in Brooklyn, but in the US. Switch and Play, of which iconic Brooklyn drag king Vigor Mortis is also a part, has also played host to Beef, a weekly all drag king show that became one of the few regular king shows in the city at the time, following in the footsteps of Club Casanova. Next, so, next slide, please. Goldie Peacock moved to Brooklyn in 2009 with early performances at Switch and Play's open drag nights at Outpost Lounge. Their performances later expanded across the city from Wild Cafe Theater to Stonewall and more. Quote, when I first moved here, the Brooklyn drag scene felt far more decentralized and scrappy than what it is now, they told me in an interview. Quote, Drag in general felt more underground and DIY than what it's become. As flamboyant as their name suggests, Goldie became an early name in the 2010s Brooklyn drag scene. Like Diane Tor and Johnny Science, Goldie Peacock has also taught for Drag King workshops, though theirs includes history as well as a range of presentation, performance, and movement possibilities. 
Next slide, please. The emergence in 2009 of another national drag phenomenon called RuPaul's Drag Race put attention on drag across the country in new ways. But since drag highlighted the work of drag queens in particular, kings and gender nonconforming individuals had to fight for attention, not unlike in the, per the performers in the days of Club Casanova. This was not lost on performers in New York. They were included in the city's growing drag spaces, but many still wanted to create space beyond being an afterthought or a token. This is an idea that has repeated often throughout the years. Whenever there's a surge in the interest in drag queens, performers in other areas of the drag spectrum speak up and initiate performances of their own. Some of the active local kings creating, them, creating space for themselves today are Max, uh, next slide. <laughs> Max Pleasure, next slide. God Complex, next. Mystery Mel, next. Uncle Freak, next. And Oliver, her face. Next slide, please. And as downtown Manhattan gentrified and got more expensive, Brooklyn rent became more affordable by the beginning of the 2010s. Parts of the borough became a haven for artistic individuals, sometimes more so than Manhattan, with venues like Spectrum, Sugarland, and Bizarre Bar, among others, all creating space for drag and queer nightlife. Events celebrating drag like Bushwig, founded by Horror Chata and Babes Trust, and the Brooklyn Nightlife Awards, founded by Mary Cherry, emerged in the borough. Brooklyn would become a space for drag kings, just as the East Village once had been. Brooklyn also became a site for gender nonconforming drag, alive and well and accepted into, highlighted and celebrated at local pageants like Mix BK, the most recent winner of which was gender nonconforming drag artist Vady Bedbug, and the Mix Nobody pageant hosted by local drag troupe The Nobodies. The Mix Nobody pageant billed itself as, quote, an unpageant for the unveiling, for unveiling the unknown, the unwanted, the underground, and the unpleasant. Outlets like these, among many others, became sites for drag across the gender spectrum, which expanded alongside the changing understanding of gender itself throughout the years. Among the most recent drag performers creating their own waves are the Cake Boys, members of which include Kings Richard, Sweaty Eddie, and Muscles Monty, and Musician Scenario. Another direct point in the lineage of Club Casanova, especially according to Mo, the Cake Boys are, quote, a New York City-based network dedicated to highlighting local drag kings, trans and non-binary performers, and queer artists through live and digital media. And here is a trailer from a recent show so you can see an example of their work. Sorry to leave you hanging. I had to hide out for a bit. <laughs> developed to give to quote give respect to the alternative performers that may have that may not have previously felt like they've been respected in these spaces and quote wanted to prove that we're just as good as the rest co-founder Richard told me for an article on insider.com uh, next slide please oh next slide there we go no 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 perfect okay <laughs> In a recent competition called Takes the Cake, inspired by the Mixed Nobody competition, performers lovingly called Kings and Things took to the stage in a friendly competition more meant to inspire community than pit performers against each other. I just feel like we're pulling away and creating a new narrative of what drag can be, Muscles Monty told me also for an art article on insider.com. The winner of the competition was Klondike, K-L-O-N-D-Y-K-E, who has in turn themselves created a new show for performers across the drag spectrum at Purgatory in Brooklyn. Uh, though the mention of drag on a national scale tends to still focus on queens, 
Kings and even more royalty have started to become included on a larger scale with features in the likes of the New York Times, Vogue, GQ, and many others. Recently, the drag horror competition Dragula featured its first Drag King contestant and winner, Landon Sider, and Chicago's Tenderoni won the 2021 Drag Queen of the Year pageant. Drag kings throughout history have sought to have sought the form as a means of economic empowerment, a way to assert and fight for social standing and political privilege. They have given themselves the permission to explore a variety of characters and express a full range of human emotion, as well as the ability to transcend patriarchal structures and question the gender binary. And with performers like those New York kings and things making space for themselves in ever increasing numbers, it's exciting to see the revolution coming from inside the house. Thank you. All righty, thank you, Alyssa. Holy moly, folks, that was our presentation. All right, woohoo! <laughs> we knocked it out of the ballpark, I tell you. <laughs> Okay, folks, so uh, Drag King History right here, we have please donate to help us continue this work. So uh, on behalf of Ken Vegas and I, we, uh, you know, thank you for participating in dragkinghistory.com, whatever donations you've given to us. Uh, thank you. And we're always looking for more. We are, it's a labor of love. And, uh, you know, you can go to our website, sign up for the newsletter, and uh, make a donation of $5, 10 whatever you got, it helps with helps us buy more books for research, helps us keep our website going. Okay, and uh, that's my plug, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for you, Mo, which is just, how did you find drag? Uh, you know, I, I Buster Hyman and Julie Wheeler, I met them in 1995 in the, when I was spending the summer in Provincetown. And I saw them perform and I was blown away. I'd never heard of drag kings. And I went, wow, they're amazing. They were, they were sexy, they were cool, they were fun. And I thought, ah, I don't know what this is me. You know, I thought it was too girly and to tell you the truth. And I was like, I'm not butch, you know, and that's, you know, I thought, huh. So I, I saw the uh, drag kings, long story, make it short, uh, drag kings in, there was an article in San Francisco Weekly and there was somebody who did this transformation. She was very femme. And she did this transformation. I said, oh my God, anybody can do this. What am I thinking? And, you know, I came back and got my hair cut, went out to the thrift store, bought a shirt that said Dick on it. And then I said, Moby Dick. And then I, uh, you know, went over to a drag queen mistress for Micah's house, had these hair clippings. And he said, girl, you're crazy. What are you doing? And I said, well, let's, let's get in drag. Help me to get in drag. And he, all he had was eyelash glue. We went to Meow Mix, the uh, dyke bar that was on Houston, and I forget where, and uh, out dancing. And as I was walking there, I'm walking by and I see these guys and I was like, oh shit, oh shit. They're gonna clock me. I'm gonna get, you know. And I walk by, they're like, hey, hey. And I'm like, oh shit, I passed, oh my God. <laughs> they didn't harass me. They didn't cat call me. And I thought, there's something to this to this drag king uh, thing. I think I'm gonna check this out. And so I went to uh, Meow Mix. Nobody recognized me. I saw Buster Hyman. I saw Julie Wheeler, a bunch of other people. They were like, "What? Oh my god!" You know. And I was hooked. I was hook, line, and sinker. Well, that's an answer to that. <laughs> Alyssa, I wanted to ask you the same question. Um, well, I'm actually not a performer. I'm just a, I'm a person who loves an art form and drag has been a part of my life for 25 years, I would say. And I've been writing about it professionally for about 11 years. And um, I think, well, so we know it has its issues now, but the the inciting moment for me was um, Tu Wang Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was younger, it was just like these, these performers were like my Disney princesses. They were, they were so powerful and strong and really glamorous and beautiful. And I had been raised on um, 1950s movie musicals. Um, so I loved color and costume and it was, it just perfectly fit into, uh, into my experience of the world at the time, which, you know, was not much, but um, it was always something I loved and thought was so beautiful. And as I got older, um, I continued to learn about it and I continued to become enamored with all different facets of gender performance. And I've been lucky enough to make it 
part of my life and to research it and write about it for a living, which is an endless gift. I love that. Tell us about your book. Oh, sure. It's called Glitter and Concrete, and it's a cultural history of drag in New York beginning in 1865 and moving all the way to the present. Um, and it's a narrative text. It's not a, an academic text. So it's um, it's accessible and immersive for everyone. And I, I want people to know that the history of drag in New York goes back a lot further than, uh, you know, they may have thought. <laughs> Um, and it'll be published by Hanover Square Press um, in 2023, which in Hanover Square Press is a, a division of HarperCollins. So. so exciting. Thank you. We've got Ken Vegas in the house. How did Ken come to drag? We lost Ken. Hello. Come in, Ken. Hi. <laughs> Um, that was awesome. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Um, Thank you. We, we have to be advocates for our own history or else it won't get passed on to future generations to reference. So, so Mo, to answer your question, how did I get into drag? Um, it was a bet back in 1996. There was a Drag King con contest um, that was inspired off of uh, Cheryl Ann Spector who went to New York who saw Drag Kings during Pride and was like, we have to have drag kings in DC. So she encouraged the um, the the lesbian Avengers to do their own drag king contest to raise money for their for the Dyke March. And um, on a bet, I was I was asked to go ahead and, and try my hat at drag kinging. And I didn't know what it, what it was. I, I just was told um, you just need to dress up in a suit and put on a mustache. So I just penciled on a mustache, borrowed my friend's suit, which is a little too small for me, but anyways, I managed. And um, I just danced around like I did back in when I was 15 years old, dancing to George Michael. And I, I was having so much fun and just the social dynamic of how people treated me differently just because they saw a mustache and a suit. I was curious of like, wow, patriarchy is real and people treat you differently based on gender um, perception. So it's become kind of a science um, project for me in terms of like discovering how do, how do I take up space? How do I change? What does it mean to be a woman? Um, what does it mean to be a person in space, like trying to break down the gender expectations of what a woman should be, you know, how, what I should be. So it's been, it's been awesome for me. Um, but anyway, so I had so much fun during the Drag King contest that I actually won, which was a surprise to me because I, I was a very um, shy person. And, um, you know, just when I heard the music and I saw the crowd, like something in me just took over and I had so much fun that they, 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 the, the judges voted me in and it was so amazing. I still have this video actually, and it's, it's pretty cool to watch um, that when I had the opportunity to open doors for other Drag Kings, I, I wanted them to experience that kind of validation and that kind of um, recognition and, and just, you know, seeing their specialness. Because I think a lot of us queers don't really have a nurturing environment around us. And, you know, since I was in a position of producing shows, I wanted to, I wanted to provide that nurturing environment to say, hey, you're awesome for exactly who you are you're beautiful, you know, you're, you're handsome, you're, you're special, you, you're talented, we love you, you know, and to, to kind of um, create like a, a sense of validation and a sense of worthiness in our community that helped heal a lot of wounds um, and, and just give people a connection point, you know? So um, that was, it's, it's more than just entertainment and putting on a mustache. It's more of a, a, a healing process for, for, you know, for a lot of uh, for a lot of people, and I was very fortunate and blessed to um, bring in over four hundred drag kings through the DC Kings, um, and give them that space. So it was pretty cool. So it's more more than me. It's it's about the the community that we all created together, which is awesome. A couple <laughs> questions that coming in: Will a recording of the Zoom be available for viewing or purchase? Uh, would love to recommend it to other kings and fans and ariel said for free even yes we'll send out the recording probably tomorrow when it's up on our website you have to be registered to obviously those of you that are here are registered 
So if somebody didn't already register, they might not get it, right? Am I right, Ariel? Oh, no. Oh, no. Ev everyone will get it. Oh, I'm totally wrong. Okay. If you're if you're registered, we'll send it to you via email. And for folks who aren't, they can find it on our website or our YouTube page. So this will this this is a, a living archive. So yeah, and I'm I'm great grateful to all of you for that. Um, Lisa, Lisa the, yeah. Oh, you got that, Ariel? Okay. Go ahead, Mo. Oh, uh, so Lisa, so there was an anonymous attendee. Mm, you got a, a secret admirer. They want to know what was the breakthrough or the moment for you to decide to do history and write about it? Well, I think it might be interesting for people to know how I met the people I met. We were teaching in uh, a language institute in the summer once, and one of the students was a nun, a lovely nun from New York. And she said to me at the end of the session, she said, you know, you have to meet my sister. I think she got, you know, some. I said, oh, that would be lovely, dear. And so she introduced me to her sister, the Dyke, who was the long-term girlfriend of the first person you saw in my series, Gail Williams. So that's why I knew these people. I mean, we now wonder how we managed without social media and all the rest of it. Well, somehow we managed, you made connections and these people made connections. They all came, they all came to the village and they came to the village from East New York, Brooklyn, which ain't easy. I can't imagine what train you take from East New York. Maybe they came by boat, I don't know. Uh, from the Bronx, from Jersey, from where Brooklyn, of course, came to uh, the village because word was out. This was uh, the place to go. This is where all the bars were, the entertainment, everything. I forget what question you asked me, of course. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, let, was, me, let me find was it. Was it important? The, the the question, I mean, I, I have wondered about this also, just the books that you've written have been about such, oh. such specific lesbian topics. How did you find them? How did you pick them? What, what moved you about them? Well, uh, in my academic career or whatever it was, uh, I did history because I think history is important. If you don't understand where you're coming from, you don't understand what's happening. I think it's so apparent uh, these days living in the country where we are. If you don't know what happened before, you might not even have hope before we were in well, I won't go into that, uh, but I think history is important. And because I knew these people and such wonderful stories, hey, what, what good times, what good times. Of course, those were good times because there was lots of money, because we had won a war. We won the war. That was the last war we won, I think. And we were the good guys, and there was lots of money. And uh, that makes a big difference. And uh, then I stumbled for uh, the undercover girl the lesbian informant who helped the FBI overthrow the Communist Party. I stumbled upon that character through something once again. Was it something Joan Nessel did? Oh, it was something Buddy Kent said in her interview. Buddy Kent was talking about her. So there you are. Always, you know, something happening. And then I found a reference to her in a prominent historian named Victor Navasky, who might not want to be mentioned among drag kings. I don't know. <laughs> Too bad, Vic. Uh, I found a reference to that character in Victor Navasky. And I told him, I said, did you know that she was a lesbian? At some panel he was on at the Graduate Center. He said, a lesbian? Really? Anyway, so it's history. But it tells us a hell of a lot. So there. Thank Did you. I say anything? Oh, yeah. Thank oh, well, you. good. OK. Thank yeah, you read so your history, much. kids. Read your history. 
Uncle uh, Uncle Joe down in Washington is reading frantically about how FDR uh, put together a new deal. So we can have one too. Read your history. <laughs> Yeah, can we do a shout out? We got people in here from Russia and Paris. Pretty fucking Ooh. cool. That's where Zoom is so cool. You know, hey, thanks for showing up. And uh, yeah, and uh, Vive la France. Yeah, it means it means so much. We love it. We love it so much. We've got this great question from Darina, who um, is asking for advice for drag king beginners. How do you choose your name? What what it what did you what advice do you have? I you know I answer you know my question of how I started. I it was a play on my name. You know I'm, I'm Mo every day, so Moby Dick just seemed like a natural Great. extension. Pardon the pun. <laughs> and uh, uh, some people play with their names. Some people just come up with a catchy phrase, something fun. I encourage you, there's go on the Facebook group, the uh, Drag Kings Unite. They have a whole directory of drag king names that are already in use. They also offer uh, drag king names and you know suggestions there. That's a great resource if you're just starting out and you're a beginner, it's a great community. And um, I would, you know, Drag Kings Unite on Facebook. I, I would like to actually, um, answer that also. Um, just think about what kind of character are you? Um, are you comedic? Are you serious? Do you want to be sexy? Are you artsy? You know, try to figure out what what sort of character are you first, and then the name will kind of frame that character. And um, yeah, so Mo, you're kind of like a, you're kind of a dick. <laughs> Lisa, a little crass. Congratulations. Mr. Mr. Dick, Mr. Dick. Mr. Dick to you, okay. Mr. Uh, Dick to you. Well, just in making fun of men and, you know, how they speak and stuff. And I remember going to um, New York to watch you at Club Casanova and just, you were very, you know, outspoken and very patriarchal in, in some of the jokes that you would make. And I was just like, not sure about it. But then once you, when I got to know you, you explained to me that you were literally making fun of men and this was your way. Of, of doing it. So, you know, your name kind of is synonymous with your act. Yeah, because uh, my motto was instead of being an angry woman, I became a funny man because yeah. I was so tired of walking the streets of New York City and getting catcalled and getting harassed. And it was just fucking annoying. And growing up with a family of six brothers and getting, you know, you had to fend your way through the, <laughs> I had to fend myself fend for myself, you know, and it was, it's tough. And, and, and still like, look at what's happening in our world today. All the bullshit that women have to go through. It's fucking ridiculous. Talk about getting me angry. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, we're it. still fighting abortion. Like that's still an issue. I mean, come on, you know, just crazy. Like the women are losing agency over our own lives. And this is what infuriates me. So if I can be outspoken, if I can throw in a wig and a mustache and be outspoken about it and people can laugh and hear me and listen, then I've made my point. Do you follow me? You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, if I'm a dick about it, then, you know, look at all the guys that are dicks. That's what I look at, you know? And so it's, you know, I, instead of being an angry woman, I became a funny man. And, you know, so it, nobody wants to hear an angry woman but a, an outspoken guy oh ha 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 you know and i thought wow are these people sadists i didn't understand it when i first was you know performing and uh yeah so that's how i it's it's i come from it from this perspective and i gotta tell you in the drag king anthology i don't recall her uh, name the person who wrote about me in that it was uh it's you can see it on my uh profile in dragkinghistory.com she wrote it was the best synopsis she got it she got exactly what i'm doing and i was like is that donna troika i don't know if it was donna who wrote about me but it was that's the book that donna edited along with uh two other people and um drag king uh anthology you could drag king history we've got a bookstore as i've mentioned a couple times you know so um, and um, the in the bookstore, we we have it broken down to research, you know, and you know, fun. So uh, fiction and film, and you know, so we're always looking for more things. Uh, um, the Frenchie, wait, for, well, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. So rude, Chris. 
Uh, you know what, Chris, if you got that film and you want us to uh, document it on Drag King History, please send it to us, info at dragkinghistory.com. If there's a way people can view it, they can purchase it, you know, whatever, we'd love to put it, post it on our site. And as mentioned, our website is being archived by the U.S. Library of Congress. Not quite yet, but eventually it will. We're in the queue. And uh, they, you know, reached out to us. And I mean, how cool is that? So all yeah, this I folks is going to last for generations. Yeah, I wanted to ask about getting picked up by the Library of Congress. What? Last year in the middle of the quarantine, they contact, they sent us an email. And I called up Ken, I said, what does this mean? I was like, what is this? Like, I, I, I what, what's happening here? And we both were like, you know, we're Googling away and we said, holy shit, this is mind blowing. Oh my God, the US Library of Congress wants, they know about our website and they want to archive us. I mean, I, oh, I got chills right now when I just said that. And I mean, it's so freaking cool. So this is going to last. Like if we, you know, when we keel over, this is going to stay, this is going to remain for researchers, yeah. for people from generations and generations to come. Super cool. I think, I think what it says is there are lots of gay librarians at the Library of Congress. <laughs> more, In other words, more smart, than smart ever people. before. There's yeah. a lot of smart people working there. Yep. Well, oh, I, used to, I used to do a lot of it. things there and you can find all kind of stuff and it's one crazy place. So. Uh, Welcome to the Library of Congress. So, uh, Met Metra Sab Sabarova, sorry if I made me to your name, said, uh, yeah, from Latvia. So, wanted to ask, how do we see the USA King relations with European kings nowadays, knowing the distance and possible cultural difference, but sharing the same lack of spaces and visibility? Uh, I, I co hosted, uh, I, mean, I hosted and co produced a, a production last year in quarantine, Kings of the World, with the, which was a global cyber drag king variety show. We had six of the seven continents represented in this show. It was so much fun. And that was a great opportunity to bring the drag kings of the world together in one location. And it was so much fun. The chat room was blowing up. And I mean, a lot of the fellas that are in the uh, in attendees, I, you know, I saw them, they were there. And it just really cool. And so that expanded the Drag King community. Again, uh, another plug, I don't run it, but uh, Drag Kings Unite is a great, uh, great community and uh, you can find support there. So in terms of visibility, you know, it's a woman thing. You know, we still, America still doesn't have a female as a president. And uh, thankfully we have a vice president in office. Vice president. You know, but not a, you know, let's hope she gets some, uh, bumped up and uh you know we'll be living in a better world <laughs> go kamala well, i like i like this as um as the last question um from brianne about is new york city considered a powerful drag king haven where else where else is there hmm. I mean, we all know that the village is the center of the world, right? <laughs> That's a great question, Brianne. Um, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for all the questions for everybody asking. Uh, there are, holy moly. I mean, Ken had, you know, for 15 years uh, uh, hosted and produced uh, uh, the DC Kings. And I mean, they're a huge scene in uh, San Francisco, huge scene in Chicago. Uh, Ireland, um, you know, Dublin, uh, uh, I mean, the kings of the world, I'm, I'm like scanning the world. I mean, it was incredible. There are drag king scenes yeah. all over the world. Yeah. And it's so friggin' cool. And um, so what I did was for kings of the world, I said, all right, I want you fellas to do a group number. So everybody, in each person in quarantine, they, they picked one song and everybody would perform to that same song and then they edited it, it together. And so we had, you could see drag kings from all over the world represented in that one song. And it was so freaking cool. Israel, um, you know, it was all over France, Spain, um, uh, not Singapore, uh, Korea. Uh, Japan, there was a couple of drag kings in Japan. I mean, it was just mind blowing. Australia, big scene, big, big scene. New Zealand, big scene. It was amazing. South Africa. 
So the question, the last question was, is there a lot of connection to other communities in the States and beyond? Um, I think what Mo did was, you know, doing it virtually um, and finding that space for it, which was excellent considering we can't fly to see each other. Um, so that was a definite solution for, for that connection. And I think we'll have to explore more of that in the future um, in this new normal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Ken and I produced a great show. Um, uh, sorry, I know we got to close. Um, but so I'll just say, you know, it was Drag King Legends and it was the Drag Kings with 25 or more years. And that was in February of this year. And uh, it was fantastic, a phenomenal show. We had uh, 15 people that we, uh, 15 performers that we showcased and uh, Drag King, we're here, you know, we're here and we've been around and, you know, and stuff. And, and as you can see from the press and a lot of other Kings have gotten press a lot, as Alyssa said, a lot of the Kings have uh, gotten accolades and won awards and contests and all that. So it's happening, it's here. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, the, the, the difference, you know, it's people will laugh when a man puts on a dress and, you know, they'll think it's a little more serious when, you know, it's more threatening for a woman to put on a suit, you know, so people don't see it as comedy. Female masculinity is still something that is, um, it, it's not revered. It's it's considered like, oh, you know, we're usurping male power and privilege. And that's right. what people are like, oh, wait a minute. Let's you know, do it. Silly. <laughs> yeah, it's silly. Well, we're doing it. We all, we've been doing it. We don't, you know, we don't. We don't yes, need a women, women really. in suits. Women in suits are scarier than men in dresses. Men in dresses are kind of fun, but uh, women in suits a little dangerous. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I'm I'm very I'm very here for this danger and and for for the the legacies that we have from this long history and for the future and and all the things that are to come. I am going to call this evening. This has been such an incredible pleasure. Thank you all so, so much. I'm so glad that we connected. Can't wait to hear more about all of your work and all of the things that are to come. Um, thank you everyone for joining us from all over the world. What a delight and an honor. Um, thank you to the LGBT, the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project for being our partner in this tonight um, to Drag King History and all of you. Thank you so much. Have a very good evening. Take thank good care. You. Thank you, Ariel. Bye. You're fantastic. Thank you. thank you. I'm having separation anxiety. I, I don't <laughs> want to leave now. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 we'll See talk you soon. soon. We'll talk soon for sure. Hey, can we just acknowledge that we nailed it? We did it. We did it in, yes. in an hour. I can think so. You did it. it. Yes. Yes. We did it in an yes. hour. Right. <laughs> All right. I just was like, ask, ask Ken. I work really fast. Yeah. <laughs> really fast. That's one thing. It's like, you know, you put me to task and I'm like, okay. Yeah, you did awesome. Amazing. Oh, thank you. I mean, from yesterday, from the rehearsal to, to, to today, uh, right, hello, right? Incredible, incredible. Yeah. I, the, the thing is, it's like, I, my mind, I get blown because there's so much information that I have a hard time, you know, right. synthesizing it. It's just, I, I feel like these women are whispering in my ears and it's our obligation to share their stories and share their magic. It and, is. Yeah, I like, it oh, is. I got it. But I mean, going through the pictures, I was like, oh, oh, can I can't, I can't, I can't. You know, I didn't want to cut anything out. You know, I love these women. I love everybody. You know, I, I'm like, oh, they're my family because they're living in my head because I'm reading about them. I'm writing, you know. So I was like, oh, gosh. Oh, but we nailed it. We did it. We yeah. did it. Yeah. Yeah. Good work, Party. everybody. And more, so much more on your website. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna and we've got we're always one of these days we're gonna get a grant <laughs> so we can have the time <laughs> to do all of this. You yeah. know, we do it in our spare time, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, I mean so so many, so many blessings for the extracurricular activities that change the world. Like, there you go. Very, very yeah. real, very real. This is really cool. Thank you for hosting us and great job, <laughs> Alyssa, Lisa, Ken. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
<laughs> and Hugh in the background. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thank you.